what I'd really like to do is to spend a, a few minutes kind of framing uh, the questions about the international system. Um, I've been assigned, quote, hotspots. Uh, were I to talk about all the hotspots in the world, we would be here all day. So I've chosen to just talk about uh, a few. But I'd really like us to have a conversation. I'd like you to think about the questions you would most like to ask. Remember, I have been around a long time. There's nothing I haven't been asked. So feel free to ask what is uh, ever on your mind. Uh, one reason I want to start with a, a broader framework of the international system rather than just the hotspots is that when you're in a position of authority uh, in the national security apparatus, President of the United States, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, Director of uh, Central Intelligence, any of the core functions of uh, international security, for that matter, Secretary of Treasury, um, it was once the case that you looked at uh, hotspots within the framework of an international system that had uh, a pr pretty clear design. And it was a design that had really uh, come into being uh, after World War II. It had three important elements. Uh, the first important element was that uh, the people who created the system after World War II uh, believed that they had to do better than what had happened between World War I and World War II. And the first element was they had to build an international economy that was not zero-sum game because they looked back at that period between the wars and they saw beggar thy neighbor trading policies, they saw currency manipulation, they saw violent conflict over resources, and they saw a, a depression, a great depression, and, uh, and another war. And so they said if we could build an international economy that actually instead was a positive sum game, where uh, the international economy could grow, where my gain was not your loss, perhaps you could mitigate some of those circumstances that brought conflict into the international system. That's why they built uh, an international monetary fund to bring exchange rates into some kind of stability. Um, what started out as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, later the International uh, Bank for Reconstruction and Development would of course become the World Bank, which became a source of, of uh, capital for countries that were coming out of, um, out of um, uh, colonialism and uh, later on out of communism itself. And um, they believed that this international economy would, uh, would bring uh, a calm to the international system. And in many ways it worked very, very well. When you think about the fact um, that that system, once the Soviet Union collapsed, would also attract the countries of the former Soviet Union so that today we can talk about investment in Poland or in Russia for that matter. Or more importantly, that when Deng Xiaoping would decide uh, that he was going to bring China, China out of isolation, China would become a part of that international economic system. So that first pillar, the international economy, uh, was one of the things that you kind of counted on whenever you were thinking about how to manage hotspots. The second was uh, a question of how to provide security in the new environment. And there, it rested fundamentally on an American global presence and a promise from the United States of America to essentially step up to uh, the protection not just of itself but of the uh, international system as a whole to protect uh, sea lanes, to uh, maintain freedom of navigation. Um, in the case of uh, Germany, to uh, encase Germany, which had been the cause of two wars, uh, into an international um, into a, um, an alliance of democratic states called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it also took a lot of bravery with the Soviet Union having exploded a nuclear weapon in 1949, five years ahead of schedule, for the United States to say under Article 5, an attack upon one is an attack upon all. In other words, if necessary, we will trade Washington for London. And so that kept the peace in Europe. Uh, then, of course, to, to uh, Asia, a Japanese defense treaty that meant that Japan would never threaten its neighbors again either. Instead, you would simply have defense force, self-defense forces in Japan. That would then be, of course, extended to Korea after the Korean War. And um, I wrote yesterday in the Washington Post, everybody talks about our longest war being Afghanistan. Well, actually, technically, our longest war is Korea. We are still in an armistice in Korea. We have 28,000 troops in Korea. 
And so to protect the South Koreans from a resurgent North, the United States committed to that defense, and then later on to the defense of the Middle East, and so on and so on. And so the United States uh, became, along with its allies, uh, the, uh, the umbrella, the security umbrella for principles like freedom of navigation and for the protection of specific countries and specific regions that might have been threatened. That system also worked extraordinarily well. Uh, there was, of course, the, uh, the Vietnam War, which did not end well. But the um, work that I was able to be a part of in 1989 to 1991 the liberation of Eastern Europe, the unification of Germany completely on Western terms, NATO remains, the Warsaw Pact goes away, uh, a pretty good, pretty good record. That system then, uh, economic, uh, an, an economic uh, system that would benefit all, uh, a security framework, that was the framework that you dealt with uh, every day. So if you were dealing with a hotspot, you had a sense of who your allies were, who uh, who you could count on. And by the way, they weren't just allies in Europe. Um, I often tell the story that my very favorite country in the world uh, as an ally was the Australians. Okay? Because talk about punching above your weight. So the United States Secretary of State is the 911 for the world. Uh, when something's about to go wrong, you get a call, can you come do this, can you come help with that? Not the Aussies. They would phone up and they'd say, hey, there's a problem in the Marshall Islands, but we've got this mate. We'll call you if we need you. So the Australians, uh, a part of this system, this uh, international system, you kind of knew who you could call on and who had limitations. Now, what happened uh, in the period, uh, really over the last 15 uh, years or so, 15 to 20 years, is you've begun to see the breakdown of that system. And so now, as somebody sitting in those, uh, those chairs, you don't have that uh, systemic framework within which to work. So how did it break down? Well, first of all, globalization as a phenomenon became extremely unpopular, particularly for people who didn't benefit from it. So um, I always said that when I would uh, teach a course in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, I always had a student of the following characteristics. Um, was uh, born in Brazil, uh, educated at Oxford, first job was in Dubai, next job was going to be in Shanghai, moved easily around the world. But most people never lived more than 25 miles from where they were born. And for them, their prospects, their aspirations were different. And you started to get a separation between elites for whom globalization worked seamlessly and people for whom it didn't. They didn't have the skills. Uh, automation, of course, became a major factor in this. And you got a backlash. And you started to get then populists who play on the notion that those elites are not for you. And that backlash then in places uh, where globalization did not touch undermined the confidence and it undermined the support for an open economy. And you started to get the argument instead, they're taking your jobs. They're the ones that are preventing you from being successful. And so this backlash, because we essentially didn't pay attention to whether globalization's um, benefits were spread equally, became an enormous problem. And then the security framework also becomes challenged. Uh, it becomes challenged in large part because the security challenges of the post-Cold War period, and now I'm talking about the period after you have integrated many of the countries into, of Eastern Europe, for instance, into the NATO framework, now it becomes about other kinds of challenges. And of course, we'll talk more about this, I'm sure, uh, the real shock of this comes on September 11th, uh, when it's obvious that uh, this is not marching armies that are the problem for security. It's uh, shadowy terrorist networks operating in failed states that are the problem for security. And practically overnight, the United States and its allies have to transform the security apparatus into doing things that it was actually not intended to do. In the immediate days after 9-11, we had to think about how to use our military forces in conjunction 
with forces on the ground and with intelligence assets to fight shadowy networks, not the armed forces that we thought we would fight. Now, it had been going on uh, somewhat uh, since the attacks uh, in 1998 on the American embassy, in embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. It had been going on a little bit uh, since the uh, rise of uh, Al Qaeda, everyone knew, but not in the way that it transformed overnight. And this tells you a little bit about decision making, and I'm going to give you a little vignette. So on uh, September 10th, we had a National Security Council meeting of the principals. The president wasn't there, so it's actually the National Security Council principals. The president had asked for a plan to eliminate Al Qaeda. He, was, he said, I'm tired of uh, swatting at flies. And so this plan was reviewed by the national security team on September 10th. In retrospect, very modest, really, talking about eliminating Al Qaeda over five, seven years. One of the interesting debates was about whether or not to use armed drones. The Air Force didn't want them because they didn't have pilots, so they didn't want them. Nobody really thought it was a great idea for an intelligence agency to have that kind of power, so the CIA couldn't do it. So the one issue that went to the president unresolved was armed drones. On September 12th, armed drones because now we knew we had to fight in the mountains of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and you're not going to do that with American forces. And so it just shows how the security framework shifted dramatically. It shifted in another dramatic way. The United States had not been attacked on its territory since the War of 1812, and we had no internal security apparatus. The one region for which there was no military command was the United States of America. In fact, it was considered to be against our values and our principles to have the American military involved in the United States. We had a security apparatus that had intelligence for the inside done by the FBI and intelligence for the, in, for the outside done by the CIA, and they didn't talk to each other, which is how, for instance, it got missed that there was this guy named Musawi who was taking flight lessons in Arizona but only wanted to know how to go one way. It was how it was missed that on September 8th, there was a phone call from a man named Hamzi al-Mitar from San Diego to Afghanistan. If anybody had known that Hamzi al-Mitar was in the United States, would have gone off because he was on everybody's list. But we couldn't surveil a phone call from uh, the United States into a foreign country. It was considered a violation of civil liberties to do that. We did not have a homeland security apparatus. Everybody else's Department of Interior basically did what people, what the FBI does in the United States plus. Our Department of the Interior did Indian reservations and national parks. And so overnight, we had to create a homeland security operation because every governor, the day after 9-11, wanted to know what does this mean for me, and we didn't even have ways of talking to the governor. So the apparatus, the, the immediate uh, efforts to transform the apparatus, and now it has transformed and transformed and transforms, lets you know the degree to which the security framework had shifted dramatically. And then it shifted again um, because cybersecurity something nobody had really dreamed of or thought of, was now uh, a greater threat again than marching armies. Uh, I was at the National Security Council in 2007 when we had the first meeting about cybersecurity. And do you know what triggered it? The Russians had shut down Estonia, which considered itself an e-country. And all of a sudden we thought, oh boy, um, boy, if they could do that to Estonia, maybe they could do that to us. And so cybersecurity uh, became a major threat, a terrorist threat, uh, along with the terrorist threat. Now, if you think about the kind of breakdown then of how we thought about security, of how we thought about the international economy, in that context you see why the hotspots now are so difficult and how they are challenging what is a fairly immature 
uh, new framework for what now is going to be the framework for, international, for the international system.